All right, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's been a great day already so far. Uh, without taking up a whole lot of time, well, I want to just make sure and introduce, especially to those of you watching now, today, later this week, whenever that is, our guest speaker today is Rick Laracy. He is uh, the uh, founder and president, I don't know what your title is actually, of uh, Flashpoint, <laughs> Flashpoint uh, Ministries. And, uh, and he is a, a, a national, international evangelist. And um, he is, we are blessed to have him uh, come with us today. So will you welcome our guest speaker this morning, Rick Lears. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, amen. Well, a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen. amen. And everybody is looking fine. I even got a hug a while ago. It was an unexpected hug, amen. I don't know who the parents are to McKenna, but she got up in my lap and just hugged me. And I thought, well, great goodness, I needed that today, amen. Anybody ever just need a hug? Well, I needed one, amen. I needed that one, amen. <laughs> Praise God. Well, listen, I'm so glad to be here with you today. I believe the Lord has given us a word and something that I feel like the Lord wants to speak to you and I today. Um, if you would, um, I know you're doing what you're doing. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, I'll invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 1. The book of Acts chapter 1. And um, then we'll also, uh, I'd like for you to stand. I know you're holding things in your hands, but I'd like for you to stand. Amen. I feel like the Lord has put me, uh, put a word for men, but not just men today, for all of us. Amen. Um, but I, you know, I know that this is what man day. Amen. Don't know what that means. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I just keep having to do the same thing I do every day, man. But uh, what a joy to be here. Um, in, in, in this scripture found in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, it said, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akil Dama which is filled with blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Verse 21. Therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, I know that that's a lot of reading of a lot of scripture, but it's important to understand that this was a very prophetic moment, a moment that had to take place, a moment that had to happen, and I'll explain that to you in a moment. But one of the things that I want to get across in your spirit today is how important it was for him who had been faithful to be chosen. Amen? Yeah. To be chosen. Faithfulness was the key. So, Father, today, as we gather in your name and as we come into your presence, we've already sensed you in this place today. I'm asking God for a special anointing to rest on your people today. I'm praying, God, that you would minister to us by your word and by, through your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will... And just envelop us in a, whole, in a haze of glory. 
That, Lord, that you would seal your word in our minds and in our hearts today. And that, Lord, that our lives will never be the same, but we will be changed in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. And amen. Turn to somebody and look at them and say, you look better than you did the last time I saw you. Amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> say it whether you believe it or not. Amen. Go ahead and say it. Amen. amen. Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you. <laughs> and what I read to you in the scripture here was um, the process they went through in choosing a replacement for Judas, choosing a twelfth apostle. And when you look at the scripture here, there's not much that we know from scripture about the one that they chose, Matthias. In fact, the only reference of him and the only time that he is mentioned in all the scriptures that we have is right here in the book of Acts, the scripture that I read to you. Now, you've got to get the picture here. There was 120 that had gathered and assembled in the upper room at the very command of the Lord Jesus. And this is right before Pentecost. This is right before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And they were, they were there because Jesus had commanded them to be there. He said, go tarry, go tarry until you be endued with power from on high. And, and so he told them to do this. And this is the place that they were going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The, the comforter was going to come. So the scripture said that around the ninth or tenth day, amen, around the ninth or tenth day, Simon Peter stood up and interrupted everything. You know, he kind of just got up and said, I've got something to say. There's something that God has put on my heart. There's something that I have seen in the book of Psalms. There's a prophetic word that we need to fulfill here before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. That's what he was basically saying. So he stands up, interrupts everything that's going on. Uh, and, and what really was going on, they were worshiping, they were praying, they were praising, they were praying. I mean, they were just in the presence of the Lord. They were tarrying in the presence of God. And so when he stands up, and, 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 and according to David's prophecy in the book of Psalms concerning the betrayal of Christ, something had to be fulfilled the, before the promise of the Spirit could come. And it had to be the choosing of the twelfth apostle to replace Judas. To, 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 it had to take place. It had to have this moment uh, before that could happen. And the criteria for choosing someone of this great office, someone for this high office of apostleship was simple. Matter of fact, it was found in verse 21. Uh, it was only two things. They must have been with him all the time. In other words, it had to be somebody that they were not one of the apostles yet, but they were always there. They were always among the crowd. They were always among the disciples. They were always there. They were always with Jesus during that time. And not only that, it had to be someone that had been there from the beginning when Jesus was baptized by John to the time of his ascension after the resurrection. And so in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that there are 12 foundations in New Jerusalem. And each foundation has upon the name one of the 12 apostles. So if the scripture is going to tell us there's got to be the name of one of the 12. Uh, each foundation has the, one of the 12 apostles names on it. I can promise you and assure you it wasn't going to be Judas of Iscariot. No. It wasn't going to be him. So they had to choose one. They had to choose somebody that had the same kind of reputation, had the same kind of faithfulness, the same kind of dedication that the apostles had had. And so the man that they would choose, his name was going to be on the 12th foundation. Now think about that for a moment. What a high honor that's going to be in eternity. It's not just, I mean, not just in a moment, in eternity, his name is going to be known as one of the foundations. Amen? Amen. So it's a massive, major decision that they've got to make. And only two criteria. They had to be there from the beginning. And they had to stay when Jesus came in and when Jesus went out. Amen? And that's what I want you to notice. Now, now what I, you need to understand here, he did not, have, it did not say he had to preach well. Hello? Did not say he had to teach well. 
Did not say you had to have some kind of great gift. Amen. Did not need to be a tremendous healer. I mean, think about this for a moment. He did not have to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Think about this. He did not have to have some super duper supernatural gift. Come on, somebody. Amen. He did not have to get called up into the third heaven and hear inexpressible words that nobody understood. Hello. He just had to be. He just had to be there. He just had to remain. In other words, he had to be faithful. Yes. Faithful. Faithful. And so they had two to choose from. They had one, Joseph called Barsabas, surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed. And they said, God, show us which of these two to choose. And, and they cast lots. Basically, they voted. You know? And, and they were asking God to lead them. So they cast their lots, and it fell on Matthias, and he became the twelfth apostle. And the only thing that mattered was not his personality, was not whether he had charisma, was not whether he was great in oratory or anything else. He had to be faithful. He had to be faithful. And I, I don't know if that means much to you, but it means so much to me. Amen. You know, because God's criteria of choosing is often not our criteria of choosing. You know, we'll choose the one with the most, uh, most enigmatic personality. That they're just, you know, just they, they're good to be around. They're, they're, you know, they got this bold look at life, and they're, 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 they're happy and they're joyful, and and they're, you know, whatever else you might want to describe them as. But yet. The only thing that mattered is they had to be faithful. Yeah. They had to be faithful. Matter of fact, the highest office in the New Testament church was the office of the apostle. And there were only 12 of them. Amen. So it had to be faithful. Faithful. And when you talk about faithfulness, it's hard to be faithful when you're going through the wilderness. It's hard to be faithful when you're going through a, a tough season. Uh, but the person who would hold this office didn't have to have some great talent, great education, or great ministry. You see, we judge differently. Hello? We judge differently. We judge people, and we judge ourselves by how much they've done, what they have accomplished, how big their ministry is, how big their church is, how successful their business is, uh, the, the success of perceived results. And, and that's how we judge people. We, we, and we do it in the church. We do it in society. We do it in our culture. It's according to how rich you are or, or how famous you are or, 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 or what kind of educational background you've got. And that's how we judge people. But you understand here, it's different. The results, see what, what happens a lot of times, we, we are results driven in a comparative manner in which we look at our lives. We compare ourselves. Matter of fact, you want to know what one of the biggest joy thieves are in your life? is when you live a life of comparison. When you're always comparing yourself to someone else. Or always comparing yourself to what somebody else has achieved. Or what somebody else has accomplished. And matter of fact, that's one of the things I hate about social media. is because people lie 98% of the time. Amen? Hello? I mean, they don't go on there. Now, don't get me wrong. You got two. You got two segments of liars on the on, on, on social media. You you got the one that are evangelistically speaking all the time, and they they exaggerate everything. They make things look better than they really are, more great than they really are. Can I get a witness in here, Amen? And then you look at that, and you go, man, my life really stinks in comparison to their life, Amen. Look at them. They just got a new house and they just got a new car and, and, and it looks like they're happy and, and you don't know they're about to kill each other, amen, otherwise you don't, you don't, you don't understand that, okay and, 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 and then you got that other side you got the drama queens and kings on the other side, amen, that let the whole wide world know all about their trouble and their sorrow I don't want to hear it, amen amen, I, I've got my own trouble and sorrow why do I want to hear all your trouble and sorrow, amen Oh, yeah. Hey, that's all right. Amen. See, God just, 
the thing God does, God says, I just want, I want, I want to know if you're going to be faithful. Will you be faithful to me? And that's good news for me. And that's good news for everyone in this room here. It's not that you have to uh, achieve some great success in life. Are you faithful? Will you be faithful to God? See, because some of the people that I rub shoulders with in life, I got to tell you, and in ministry make me feel like I'm a failure in the kingdom. Hello? I learned a long time ago that you have to let iron sharpen iron. And, a lot of, and, and, and you have to get around right people. And sometimes right people are people that have done, in, in your eyes, that can do so much and, and accomplish so much. And, and what I've learned is when you go around those kind of people, just be quiet. Amen? Just be quiet and listen. Because if you don't say anything, they won't know how dumb you really are. Amen? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So I, I just go around them and be real quiet. And I want to learn. I want to learn from them. I want to learn, you know, and, and what, I, what I found out is the same criteria for them. It's the same for me. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. See, there are great men and women in the kingdom of God that are doing great things. And, and then I look at Matthias and I realize that there, there's, there's one way that I'm equal with all of them. And that is just be faithful with what God has called me to do. Amen? Just be faithful with what God has called me to do. And then the important thing is to find out, though, what God has called you to do, what God wants you to do. And, and, and so matter, it doesn't matter how small or insignificant it is, be faithful doing whatever God has called you to do. Amen. It took me a long time to get there. I, I remember 22, 23 years ago when God spoke to me about evangelizing, I told him, no, flat out, I don't want to do that. Hello? Now, in fact, here's, here's one of my exact words. No, I'm happy where I am, and I don't want to starve to death. <laughs> Those were my exact words, amen? I was pastoring my church up in Maryland, and I had a good congregation. Had My house was sitting right on the second hole of the golf course that I love. And, and, and you know, if you're a golfer, you know what I'm talking about. Just being on the golf course is like second heaven, Amen. And I mean, and, and I was happy with everything, the way things were going, and, and, and I was satisfied. Don't get me wrong, there's things I would love to change. There's always something pastors want to change or want people to change or want you know to happen in your church. But God said, I called you to that. And when I when I finally gave in, and it took me six months to give in, amen. And I started doing what God wanted, I found my niche. I found my calling. I found the covenant. So when people ask me now, do you ever want to pastor again? No. Why would I stoop to pastoring when I'm doing what I know God wants me to do? Do you, do you want to do something? No. no. Why would I want to do those things if God has called me to do what I'm doing and he's keeping me busy and he is keeping me busy doing it. Amen. See, God never overlooks your faithfulness. God never looks beyond your faithfulness. Amen. See, the enemy tries to, to, tries to beat some of us up over the things that, that have happened in our past, the things that have happened yesteryear. Amen. And, he, and, and he's made some people feel like that they're a failure in life because they never measure up. Hello. They never measure up to what they think they ought to measure up to or what everybody else thinks they ought to measure up to. But listen to what I'm saying. Uh, You've you got to learn to be faithful. You gotta learn to remain. God's looking for people that are gonna say, you know what, I'm gonna stay faithful. I'm gonna stay the course. I'm gonna do what God wants me to do. I'm gonna be the man or the woman that God wants me to be. Amen. And that's what faithfulness is all about. Matter of fact, give me a let me give you a definition of faithful. It means you remain. In other words, you don't run when you feel like running. Hello. You don't leave when you feel like leaving. You don't quit when you feel like quitting. You remain. Now, if anybody has a life like I've had, there are times that you just want to quit. There are times that you just want to, you know, what's the use of trying anymore? What's the use of being faithful? And if you think that way, you've missed the point altogether. Being faithful even when you have no recognition. 
when nobody notices what you're doing. Because you aren't doing it for recognition. You're not doing it for somebody to pat you on the back. You just remain. You remain in the good times and the bad times. When things are beautiful and when things are ugly, you just remain. Amen? You, you remain. You stay. When, you, when it feels like God has left the building, amen, you stay. You remain. When you, when you can't feel anything, and you don't feel anything because you're in a wilderness, you're going through a, a tough season, but you remain anyhow. You stay anyhow. If I always went by my feelings, I would be schizophrenic. Amen? Yes. I, would, I would be crazy. I'd have no testimony of faithfulness. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. You remain faithful. That's, what I'm, that's, that's the anointing that we need in this day and age that we're living in. We need an anointing just to be faithful. Amen. And according to the scripture, there are two reasons that you go into a wilderness. You ever thought about that? The Bible says that Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. Sometimes God wants you in the wilderness to teach you. To lead you, to guide you, to minister to you, to help you. Sometimes he leads us into a wilderness experience to get things that are in of us that is not like him out of us. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? The Bible says that, that, that there was a demoniac at Gadaria that, that, that was driven by the devil into the wilderness. You remember that? Sometimes you are driven by the devil into the wilderness. Amen. Sometimes he's driving you there to destroy you, to, to, to kill you, to steal what kind of faith you have. And, and I don't know about you, but I've, I've been on the ends of both of those. Where it's the enemy driving me into the wilderness or, or the Spirit of God driving me into the wilderness. And their purposes are totally different. See, God will lead you into a wilderness to test you. Hello, amen. Amen. God test us. I, you know, I still have an aversion to test. I don't like tests, amen. Never have liked tests. I get high anxiety when it comes to tests, amen. I don't, you know, anybody know what I'm talking about? If you, you know, I don't like tests, I mean, I just don't like them. Uh, I don't like going through a test. God, if you don't know I love you by now, why, I mean, come on, help me out here, okay? Um, why, why are you testing me? I, I, I've already told you I love you. I've already committed my life to you. Why you want to test me even further, oh man? Does anybody ever feel that way? God, I, I'm tired of the test. You know? You know? But then the devil, he just loves to drive you into the wilderness to kill you. You know? He just wants to kill you. He wants you to be done with. And the only thing you must do when you're in the wilderness is just remain faithful. Remain faithful. I don't know what season you're in right now. I don't know what you're going through in maybe your family, on your job, or, or in your mind, or what you may be experiencing today. But I've come by here to this place today to let somebody know that God just wants you to remain faithful. Yes. Remain faithful. You see, some, some people are just like greenhouse Christians. Hello? They only bloom in protected environments. Hello? As long as they're protected, they can bloom. As long as they're covered, they can bloom. As long as they're sheltered, hello, amen, they can bloom. As long as the wind and the waves and the storm and the rain doesn't touch them, they can praise the Lord. They can have a smile on their face. But the time is going to come, and it comes in all of our lives as we walk with the Lord. The time will come when you can't see Him. You can't feel Him. And sometimes you can't hear Him. Amen. If you're hooked on a feeling, I got news for you. Feelings are fickle. Amen. Amen. You can feel it one moment and not feel it the next moment. You can be married to somebody for 30 years and feel like you love them and then also feel like you could kill them. Amen? <laughs> Don't look at me with your pious religious attitude. Amen? <laughs> Amen? You stay with someone long enough, they're going to get on your third nerve at least once in a while. Amen? 
Can I get a witness in the house? Am I the only one that's put myself way out here on this limb and somebody's about ready to chop it off on me? Amen. Come on, help me out. Amen. You know, we all go through those times. There's nothing wrong with that. Except you have to understand, we all go through the wilderness. You know, I remember last year when I had heart surgery, triple bypass. It came as a surprise to me. I uh, I didn't think I had any heart problems. As a matter of fact, my dad had heart disease, but I figured it was his 40 years of alcoholism and cigarette smoking that contributed more to his health issues than would be mine. And I found out wrongly later on that it was kind of a hereditary kind of thing that happens. It just delayed on me because I didn't have the lifestyle that my dad had. And so when I heard a friend had passed away, suddenly at 62 years of age, of a heart attack with no symptoms, uh, no uh, indications that he was in any compromise in his health. And I told my doctor at my appointment about my friend. I said, how can this be? You have no symptoms. You have nothing going on that would indicate that you've got a problem. And next thing you know, you're gone. And so he said, well, you seem a little concerned. I said, well, I am concerned. I'm 62 too, amen? <laughs> you know? I, I'd really like to know if I'm walking time bomb, you know. I'd just like to know. And he said, well, let's do a stress test. Well, I didn't make it through the stress test. The EKG showed an abnormality. Matter of fact, what really stuck, really just, just, just surprised me was when they told me I had a heart attack. I said, really? I wonder when that happened. I mean, I just did not remember when I would have a heart attack. I figured I would know. I mean, don't you think you would know if you had a heart attack? Amen. And then he explained to me that sometimes people have silent heart attacks. And they don't even realize it. And then they did a heart cath and they found three blockages of 80% or more. And then they found a sixth artery. And I thought, wow, a sixth artery. He said, yeah, when your heart is compromised, it's nature. I said, he said, nature. I said, God. He says, nature. I said, God. He said, it's nature, and I said, God creates a new artery to help compensate for the ones that are blocked. He said, you're one of the rare ones that developed a sixth artery, and that's why you were not as symptomatic as you could have been. And then all of a sudden, it hit me, the devil tried to kill me. Hello. In June 22, I was in a hotel room in Ruston, Louisiana, the Hampton Inn. At 3.30 in the morning, I woke up with, I thought, acid reflux. And I was going to the restroom as quick as I could to spit it out at 3.30 in the morning. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up on the floor. I had fallen. I had passed out. I had fallen, hit my head, bruised three ribs, bruised my hip, scraped up my left arm pretty bad. And I had swallowed those gases, and my chest felt like an inferno. And when I told the, the doctor that, the cardiologist that, he said, that was your heart attack. I said, I thought it was acid reflux. I even went to a gastroenterologist and told him what happened. He said, you just need some acid reflux medication. So they put me on medication. I did need it, but I mean, I thought it was a heart attack. He didn't even mention anything about it might be a heart attack or anything like that. And I remember laying on that floor when I was waking up from that, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm in Ruston, Louisiana. I'm at the Hampton Inn. And I said, Lord, don't let me die in Ruston, Louisiana. I don't know nobody here. Hey man, you understand what I'm saying? I'm by myself. I don't know nobody here. And I, as I laid there thinking, now should I call 911 or should I, should I call the front desk or what should I do? And, and the thought was, and this is how demented I, I was in that moment, the thought was, well, if I don't want to die here, you don't want to put yourself in a place that they might kill you here, hey amen? <laughs> and so I just took five tongues Went back to bed, woke up three or four hours later and continued on my journey and didn't really think much about it until I got to the gastroenterologist and told him what happened and he gave me medication. And now I'm sharing this with my doctor and he said, that was your heart attack. And then I thought, the devil really did try to kill me there. He really did. But I remember after all of that, when I would go through the surgery last, matter of fact, my surgery was on Good Friday of last year. When I had that surgery and I came out, I, I, my heart was weaker than it was when I went in. 
That was a surprise. Not just to me, but to the doctor. But they said I had another heart attack between the operating table and, in, and ICU or, or cardiac care unit. And I said, y'all didn't tell me nothing about that when I was in the hospital. Well, we probably did, but you were probably out of it, amen. I said, well, now I know in October after that, he tells me that. And that's why your heart has not regained its strength. Instead of having an extraction rate of 60, which is optimal, when I came out of the operating room, I had a 20. And then I had a 40 in October last year. I'm hoping to get back up to 60. I don't know if I'll get there or not, but I'm trusting God for the healing grace and his healing mercy. The point I'm trying to make here is just simply, I went through a season after that surgery. I went through depression. I've never been a depressed person in my life. I mean, I don't know what depression was, but I'd be laying in my bed at night and fear would grip my heart and depression would overwhelm me. And I would, I would think about my life and would think about where I'm at and think about how it's over for me that I'll never be able to do or be as strong as I need to be able to do what I love doing the most. And I, and I have depression that set in on me. And, and, and so when I, when, I, when I tell you, you know, in that moment, that moment, I couldn't feel him, it seemed like. I couldn't see him. I, I, I couldn't hear him. It just seemed like it was a dead moment in my life, amen. But I've got news for you, amen. That, that's when I learned I had to stand anyhow. Amen. That's how I, I had to believe anyhow. That even though I couldn't feel him, even though I couldn't see him, even though I couldn't understand why I was feeling the way I was feeling and experiencing what I was experiencing, I had to put my trust in the Lord anyhow. Yes. Amen. And believe that he's going to take care of me. And all I had left in that moment was faith. Faith. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, I don't feel it sometimes, but I know it. You know? I don't have to feel saved to be saved. I just have to know I'm saved. See, some people are hooked on the feeling. And you can't be hooked on the feeling. Sometimes you're not going to feel saved. Sometimes you're not going to feel holy. Sometimes you're not going to feel righteous. Sometimes you're going to feel worthless and hopeless and without but that's not a time to quit. That's not a time to give up. That's a time to, to drill down and say, you know what? I'm still going to trust the Lord. Amen. The Bible didn't say Matthias liked everything that happened. You know, can you imagine that? I mean, I imagine Matthias. Matter of fact, he was there when he came in. He was there when he went out. So in other words, he saw every miracle. He saw every blind eye open. He saw every demon cast out. He saw healings. Of, of people that couldn't walk. He saw miracles of multiplication. And, 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 you know, and he may not have liked some of the things that were happening in the early church. You know? He may have not liked some of the things that he saw in the upper room that day. I don't know. But there may have been times that, that, that maybe he, he would hear someone preach or speak or, and he didn't like the preacher. Hello, amen? Do you know? Well... But he remained faithful. You know? There are some people I wouldn't cross the street to hear. Hello? But if the Lord wanted me to go over there and hear him, I'd probably have to go. I'm trying to leave probability in there somewhere. Amen? You know, faithfulness, what faithfulness does, it gives you glimpses of intimacy. Think about that for a moment. You know, Matthias, we don't have any record that he ever performed a miracle. We don't have anything that said he did anything big spiritually. Hello? He was just there. He was just there. There's something to be said for people that are just there. That are just thankful. Let me tell you something. There's something to be said for members of churches that don't have no great gift, don't have no great ability, they're not up front. They're not playing an instrument. They're not singing. They can't sing. You don't want them to sing. Amen. Hello? Or let's put it this way. You don't want to stand next to them while they're singing because they'll get you way off note. Amen? Hello? You understand what I'm saying? There's something. But, but, but listen to this. Listen to this. God still 
requires faithfulness. The fact that they are still there. The fact that you're still here. The fact that you still trust the Lord. The fact that you have put your hope in Him. The fact that you pay your tithes. You give your offerings. You come to the house of God. You, you, you speak to people. You, you let them know that you love them. You let you know them know that you encourage them. Amen. There's something to be said for remaining faithful. Hallelujah. After Jesus was gone... And there were people around Matthias that were saying that they didn't really believe that he was raised from the dead. You know? And they don't really believe that he cleansed the leper. They don't really believe that he opened blinded eyes. They don't really believe that, that he did these miracles that he did. I can just see Matthias in the crowd just lift his hand and say, Pardon me. I was there. I was there. I saw with my own eyes. I was there. I saw the eyes of Bartimaeus open. I saw the ten lepers cleansed. I saw the demoniac at Gadaria go from a wild naked man cutting himself in a cemetery full of a legion of demons and then see him sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind clothed. Talking about a transformation in a life. I saw it. You, you don't have to believe it. But I got news for you. I saw it. And I'll believe. And yeah, that's all. No big deal. Just want you to know. I was there. You know I love this quote. A man with experience. Is never at the mercy of a man. With an argument. Amen. Amen. Now you can tell me all you want to tell that God is dead, that God is not real, that there is no God. But since I've already experienced him in my life, since I've already experienced him in my soul, since I already experienced the joy and the peace that he can bring, you're too late to the table. You're too late. You can't tell me that he's not real. You can tell me about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was just for those on the day of Pentecost. And it's not for today. Well, I'm sorry, you're too late. Since, I, since I've already received, hallelujah. Since I've already spoken tongues. And, and since I already have the prayer language, amen. And I already know the anointing of God. You're too late to the game to tell me it's not real, amen. You understand what I'm saying to you? A man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument, amen. You can argue all you want all day long, but I've got news for you. I've already experienced the glorified Jesus, amen. Yes. And there's nothing like him. Yes. Hallelujah. You can tell me healing's not real. But if you've never experienced healing... Amen. Or if you've ever experienced it, let's put it like that. You're not at the mercy of an argument. Amen. You know, I, I, you know, I got news for you. I've experienced him. See, what I believe we need today, as much as anything, is we need an anointing to be faithful. I call it the Matthias anointing. Just to be faithful. An anointing just to be faithful. You know, when we look at society, the present culture of our day, it is a witness of the lack of commitment and faithfulness. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, look at the high cost of not being faithful. The number one domestic problem in this country is the breakdown of the family. It's the breakdown of the family. That's where you, you, you get all this junk that we've got going on. This gender dysphoria, this transgenderedness, and there's 72 different genders. And you can identify with whatever you want to identify, amen? The, the, the lunacy of our society is because they're doing everything they can to minimize the importance of the family unit. You know, it's an attack on the family. So an attack on marriage, you know. You know, the only marriage that God sanctifies is a marriage between a man and a woman. 
Because it's the only union that can reproduce. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. And that's what he said for you to do is reproduce. You can't do what God tells you to do in any other kind of relationship. The point I'm simply saying, this is the high cost of not being faithful. Amen? Matter of fact, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, there are 24 million children in America. One out of three. There are 70, about 75 million. About one out of three children in the United States of America live in a biologically Father, biological father absent home. In other words, they live in a home with a single parent or else the man figure in the house is a stepfather or a boyfriend. Can I, you know, they're not married. One out of every three children in America live in that type of home. Now think about it for a moment. You know, 53% of all marriages, and that doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, end in, in divorce. Matter of fact, the statistics say that a, that a kid raised without a dad is five times more likely to be poor and to commit crimes. That nine times they're more likely to drop out of school. Twenty more times they're likely to end up in jail. A biologically absent father's home. The U.S. Center for Marriage and Family tells us in their research that the family structure was consistently found to be the deciding factor in a wide range of children or child behaviors that directly influence academic performance, including emotional and psychological distress, attention deficit disorders, social misbehavior, substance abuse, sexual activity, and teen pregnancy. The family influences more than anything else. I'm not saying it won't happen in an intact family, but I am saying that it's less likely to happen in an intact family. Hello? Yes. Children from non-intact homes had higher rates of stress, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, particularly among teenagers. And when I read those kind of statistics, you know, when I see those things, the conviction hits my heart. We need a Matthias anointing to just be there, to just remain, just remain. You know, I grew up in a, a single parent home, by and large. First five or six years of my life, my dad was either in Korea, well, he was in Korea when I was born. He was in Vietnam, two different tours, a year each. He was in Germany on a year tour. So my first five or six years, he wasn't around. But then when he was around, he wasn't around. He was an alcoholic. And he'd get drinking, and he'd leave, and be gone for months at a time. And, uh, Deserted our family, not once but twice. When I was 13 was the last time he deserted our family. My mom pretty much put an ultimatum down. You're not drinking. You're not bringing alcohol in this house. So you have a choice to make. You can either choose your family or choose alcohol. And he chose alcohol. So mom raised me and my younger brother by herself. She did a great job. If she had not been the godly, praying, hard-nosed woman that she was, I dare say that me and my younger brother today would not be in ministry and would not be where we are. We would be probably one of the statistics that I read to you. The outlier for us is we had the one parent that said, no, no. If you think I don't mean business, I'll kill you. <laughs> Hello, amen. And we knew she wasn't going to kill us. But, you know, I'm just being up. She's 5'11 and a half, about 225, 30 pounds. She could handle herself, amen. You understand what I'm saying? Her backhand was a, a powerful backhand, amen. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, you, that's abuse. You've been abused. You've been abused. No, I was disciplined. 
There's a difference, amen. She still loved me. She told me, she loved me. I never had a dad that said, I love you. He never said, I love you. Even in adult years, when mom and dad would get back together after 12 years of divorce and separation, in the last 13 years of his life that he lived, and we celebrated them being with mom, he never said, I love you. Never said, I'm proud of you. I didn't have that affirmation from a father. So what I did, I overcompensated. And my three boys have never been a day that I've been around them that I hadn't said I love them, that I'm proud of them. And two of them have families of their own that are in church today, serving God on worship teams in the church that they go to. And the other son, still at home, needs to get a job. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, those kind of things happen in life. But the bottom line is you just just to be there. Just to be there. To be steadfast. To be firmly planted. We need the kind of anointing that says, I'm not going to run when I feel like running. And I'm not going to quit when I feel like quitting. I'm going to hang in there. And I'm going to fight for my family. And I'm going to fight for my children. And I'm going to fight for my church. And I'm going to fight for my country. And I'm going to fight for what is right. I'm going to fight for righteousness. I'm going to fight for holiness. Amen. Here's what I know about God. If you stay faithful, even in the worst of times, your season will change. Well, that's a prophetic word for somebody here this morning. Somebody that maybe, maybe, maybe you have felt like quitting lately, and maybe you felt like giving up, or maybe you felt like, what's the use of trying anymore? I've got news for you. If you'll stay faithful, if you'll hang in there, if you'll trust God, if you'll put Him first, amen, your season will change. It will change. I said it will change. It will change from being that hard, arduous moment that you're going through to that moment of relief, that moment of blessing, that moment of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. God, and God will do a new thing in your life and it will spring forth shall you not know where he makes rivers in the desert and the way in the wilderness Can somebody shout amen. amen hallelujah hallelujah sometimes you may feel like God has left you alone right where you are right now it may seem like that all things are lost and hopeless you may feel desperate and without but God will revisit you and give you an anointing to remain to remain, an anointing to be faithful. An anointing to be faithful. And so what I want to pray this morning and what I want to speak this morning over somebody here today is that you receive this, this message. And you receive this Matthias, I call it the Matthias anointing. And be determined to remain. To be determined to remain. To be faithful. Maybe you ought to say something like this out loud. I will not quit. Come on, say it. I will not quit. Say it. I will not quit. I will not quit. Amen. I will not quit. I will not quit. You know, sometimes I, I don't mean just talk about me, but I'm transparent. I'm an open book. And sometimes, I got, I got to be honest with you. Sometimes I feel like quitting. I wished it had been a long time ago that I had that feeling. But I actually had that feeling this morning. <laughs> and I knew I had to come here and preach. But I felt like quitting. And then in my mind, I saw that bald-headed pastor's face. <laughs> and I just had this sense that if he was standing in front of me, he'd go, no, 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 no. You're not doing that to me today, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying well, I guess what I'm saying is that the enemy is always pounding you with thoughts he's always pounding you with your inadequacy he's always pounding you with the feeling of hopelessness the feeling that you're not doing enough. The feeling that you've not done enough. The feeling that you can't do it. But it's in those moments you've got to realize 
God is never going to stand over you and, and just point at you with his finger and say, you're no good. You're never going to accomplish anything. That's the job of the condemner. That's the job of the one who brings condemnation. He's the one that does that to you. God is just there when you call on him to affirm you and lift you up and help you in your time of trouble. So I will not quit. Amen. I will not quit. I will not quit pursuing the promise that God has spoken over my life. I will not quit living the life that he has called me to live, a life of holiness. I will not quit working for the kingdom of God. It's not about the church. It's not about an individual. It's about the kingdom of God. And I will not quit. Amen. You see, our master sees our faithfulness. Yes. You see, the satisfying reality is one day, this is what I'm looking for, and I hope you're looking for the same thing. You and I will hear those words, well yes. done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. That's what it's all about. Yes. That's what it's all about. You know, I hear people sometimes because they go through tough seasons and hard times and, and sometimes they say, well, when I get to heaven, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why did he allow this to happen? And why did this take place in my life? And why did I have to go through such and such and such and such? No, you won't. No, you won't. You'll be so happy you got there, you won't even think about those things anymore. Amen. I'm thinking that. You won't even remember them. I mean, it wouldn't be. Do you think it would be heaven if you're sitting up in heaven with sorrow, crying with tears over someone you missed getting there? See, I've got news for you. One of the bad parts of hell is that they're going to have a memory. And they're going to think about the opportunities that they had to get it right, to serve the Lord, to follow after the Lord. And now it's too late to do it, amen. But the bottom, and the bottom line is, those that are in heaven are not thinking about those in hell. Well, that's rough, isn't it? But here's what I know about faithfulness this morning. Faithfulness will bring you out of your wilderness. It will bring you out of a dry place spiritually. It will carry you through a discouraging season that you may be going through. It will bring you again into the showers of refreshing, the showers of anointing, amen, because God is faithful and he keeps his word, amen. I said he keeps his word. I said he keeps his word. And we need that kind of anointing. I call it the Matthias anointing to make a difference in our families, in our culture, in our community, in our church. We need that kind of anointing. Amen. We need that. I need that. You need that. We all need that. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Yeah, go ahead and come on with some music.